Film Festival is going to be very different from previous years. Uh, still some wonderful films, some fantastic guests from around the world, but this year we won't be together in a cinema. It's going to be 100% online. And so we asked a great, great friend of the festival to join us uh, to share his thoughts about film festivals in general and about the Dublin International Film Festival in particular. It's my very great pleasure and honour to say hello to Colin Farrell. Hey Colin, how are you doing? I'm good, Gronya. Yeah, how are you doing? Thanks for the intro. No, I'm delighted. My, so much. I'm delighted to speak to you, love. Yeah, I wish I, I wish I could be home for this. I wish we could all be having a more typical and less special experience through so much of, of what we're doing in our lives, you know. It'd be great to be home, but but fair play to you for putting this on and for allowing people the access to cinema still, you know. It's important, I think, especially yeah. now, perhaps. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think there's something really interesting, actually, about the move to online. You know, it seems to give a great potential for new audiences and, and, you know, potentially people who may have not felt the festival was for them. Have you totally. I mean, they, they, you know, there's no way, as we, as we all know, you know, um, living virtually is now become such an important staple of our shared experience globally and, 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 and locally, wherever we live. Um, it, it, it pales in comparison to the um, immediacy and the intimacy that we feel when, like if you and I were even having this interview in person, I'd prefer to have it in person, I'd prefer to be in the same space, it should be able to give you a handshake or a squeeze if that was okay and, and, and sit down and have a natter, you know, and share the same air, but, but, it's, but it's, it's brilliant that we have it, it's amazing that we have this and it's incredible that, look, film festivals are a boutique industry, you know, there's not that many people that get to experience them. Um, Locals get to film festivals in Toronto or in Dublin. Obviously, people from Toronto can have easy access to it, or those from Dublin can have easy access to the Dublin International Film Festival. But you know, it's 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 they are things that are usually um, outside of the industry people that come into a city to avail of what the film festival provides. It usually is just local people that go to it. You know, every now and then you'll get some real cinephiles that aren't being paid to go but will fly in as fans but what this does virtually is of course as you said it opens it up to a greater uh, panoply of people and a, and a wider audience and allows people to get a sense of of the kind of opportunities and the kind of films that are on display during a festival and the passion that really fuels every film festival you know for every film festival there's a there's a Gronya Humphreys or a Michael Dwyer you know Lord rest him um, you know there are people behind the scenes who work the whole year to make this three days, one week, two weeks, whatever the festival duration is to make it possible. And it's so much work and it's so much organization. Um, but they're incredible experiences. Film festivals are so much fun. And I've never went to one just as a fan and I've always been threatening to. I've always been, no, and I've always been threatening to. It's one of those pipe dreams, you know, where I go, oh, I have to one day and I never have. Um, because the energy in, during film festivals and, and when I think back to my time, what I can remember of the Dublin International Film Festivals through the years. Uh, might have to point the finger at a few blackouts had, but um, they're just incredibly excitement, exciting times. You know, they're just the energy, everyone is there, and it's a, it's a shared journey of discovery. That's no, what I want to so throw that. a couple of film titles at yeah. you, because I remember my first Colin Farrell film, but I don't know if you were there. Were you, were you in the screen for Drinking Crude? I was, yeah. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I actually remember that one very vividly. That that Owen McPolin wrote and directed. Owen, who's who's obviously as you know now, you know, still working away as a as a cinematographer and, and has an amazing career. And um, I haven't crossed paths with him since then. And that was Jesus. No, what was that? Twenty four. So it's ninety seven, Colin. <laughs> yeah, it was twenty four years. My maths was better than I thought. Disappointingly, twenty four years ago, Jesus. So I haven't met Owen, but I do remember that night very well. And I remember Andrew and I remember Eva. Whoa! And what was that about? Come here. Oi, oi. Come here, come here. Luna. Colin's dog, Luna. who was asleep on a couch when this, this interview this, started. This is Luna. Luna, come here. Luna, I'd stand up only to see him wearing boxers. I'd go and get her <laughs> otherwise. Luna. Oh. Um. I'll be in a sec, guys, just on an interview. Hey, Jimbo. Hey, son, I'll be in a sec. Um, so what were we saying? Yeah, 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 I do remember that. And I remember that as well because that was where I met Lisa Cook at the screen. Oh, wow. The screen was behind Pierce Street. It was Pierce Street, wasn't it? Yeah, it's Street. not there anymore. 
Yeah, no, I know, I know. I rude the day that that was that that was closed down. That was a great cinema. Yeah. Um, and I remember having a great night. And that was I met Lisa Cook uh, from the Lisa Richards agency that night, and she yeah, said, yeah. "You want to have a chat or whatever." And um, and that led to other things. Yeah. So that was a very important night for me. And Drinking Crude was the first film that I got to do, and the first time I got to work with a bunch of actors on a film. So, yeah, the Dublin Film Festival has really that represented was... for me. Abs it's an absolute origin story for me yeah because it's funny we worked it out well i worked it out that you've sh we've shown 10 of your films and you've been here for five of them and the next one was one that i talked to about four people since i said that i was going to talk to you and they went i remember that screening it was tigerland in cine world do you remember that it was tigerland. 2001 so it's 20 years ago it was in cine world which is in parnell street and it blew yeah. the roof off the actual screening. There was this incredible q and A. I I remember Michael. Michael Dwyer. Yeah. I remember lovely Michael Dwyer, who had such a passion for cinema and obviously was, you know, one of the great founders, if not the, the, the total foundation for what has become the Dublin International Film Festival. Um, I remember talking to Michael and I remember Michael being really gracious with me and very kind and, and feeling almost... Um, I, there was a sense of shared excitement. Yeah. And I always felt that, to be honest with you. I don't mean to try and play the, the nationalistic card, but I always felt that. I always felt when I went away that I was representing Ireland in some way. I mean, I wasn't wearing the jersey and stuff, and there wasn't a competition, but um, I always felt people were always really decent with me when I got home. Like, they really were. And I expected a couple of, I've said this before, I expected a couple of slaps or a couple of digs at some stage in a pub, some night in Dublin, someone yeah. just wanted to get one over on me. But everyone was always very decent, and I always felt, felt that there was a little bit of pride or something. Um, and I and that felt and Mike, I felt that off Michael, and I felt that that yeah. night there was everyone was really it was celebratory, celebratory that that a kid, and it could have been anyone, like it could have been, it just happens to be me for a number of reasons, many of which I know for a fact are outside of my control. But it happened to be, you know, a Dublin kid came back from having a bit of success yeah. in America and there was a big yeah. celebration and it felt really good. Huge to be the celebration. It, felt re it really was lovely. It was a lovely, a lovely welcome. Yeah. And at that stage, I wasn't, I didn't know where I was living at that stage, Juanya. So I was, I was living, I was spending a lot of time away from home. I was missing a lot of home. I was more homesick, I think, than I realized or I wanted to fess up to because I was living this dream and I was having all these adventures. So I was keenly aware that I had to be grateful for that. But any time I got home, I, I, I experienced such sustenance. And that's what basically the Dublin International Film Festival offered me back then, was a great kind of anchor to come home and to be able to meld what my life was becoming, which was a life working in film and also a life that had been lived for 20 years in a person's place of birth. So, so there was the profundity of being from the place and there was the newness and the exoticism of bringing in this idea of a journey through film or the beginning of a journey in film. I mean, I didn't know if I was ever going to do another film again, so I was definitely going to enjoy it that first time out, you know? Yeah, I mean, because the interesting thing about Tigerland is that that was 2001, and I think it was two years later that Michael kind of relaunched the festival, and you were back, I think, with the only kind of double header because you were with Phone Booth and The Recruit. Do you remember that? And it was like... Yeah, I, yeah, I do. Film. I do. Yeah, I do remember that. I remember that. Now, I think that one was a bit more debaucherous. So I, I, I think I might remember less of it. Um, but the I crowds. Truly do remember. But the crowds were, were they? There were I mean, huge like crowds, yeah. And with lovely photos of you doing the autographs, because you were always really connected to the people who were like coming along, you'd chat away to them, they'd all know you. Do you know what I mean? It was that lovely kind Yeah, of no, it felt nice, man. Mom, that much I know. The sister and the brother. You yeah, know? and it was always a big, we always, it was always a big family affair. And like even the, the premieres we had in, um, in Los Angeles, like back in the day for the recruit and for, I think, SWAT and something else, maybe fun with, I don't know, but there were a few of the premieres back in the day in Los Angeles. I had a bunch of the family come over, you know, I, I could fly the family over at that point. And I mean, I had like 20 or 30 family and friends, you know, rallies and stuff, uncles and aunties and That's nephews fantastic. and friends. No, Grainne, it was amazing. And I think I just did. Yeah. Anyway, it was, it was amazing. And it just meant that it wasn't, we could all share in it, you know, because I, I didn't want it to, 
truly didn't want it to be about me and I mean, don't get me wrong, I have a big ego and there's plenty of stuff in life I want to be about me. Don't get me wrong. But uh, that was too big for it to be. I think that was probably too big for it to be about me. And so I wanted what I did by bringing my family over to Los Angeles for the premieres, that was just offered up to me on a platter when the Dublin yeah. Film Festival was on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It, was, it was almost because an LA premiere wasn't the Dublin Film Festival that I had to fly everyone. You know, yeah, of course, you know. What's that say? I just have problems being alone. But um, but no, the, the, the yeah, Dublin's always the film festival has always been an amazing time for me. And I again, Michael Dwyer. I was so sad the day that he that he died, yeah. and he was taken. Well, unfortunately, your time is your time. But he was taken way before what I had wished his time would have been. You know, he was such a such a purist and a lover of cinema and of the kind Champion. of of the of the collective the collective energy of cinema as well, which again is what. You know, some cinema, uh, you know, whether you experience whether you're one person on your own in a dark room or whether you're sharing it with 300, film is film, but there is something beautiful. And I go to the cinema, you know, to the theatre on my own in the afternoon sometimes, and I love it. But there's something so beautiful about the, the communal element and dynamic of sharing film with, uh, with other people. And that's never more exemplified than it is during a film festival, I find. Yeah. No, I, no, I absolutely agree. I remember, I remember going to Toronto with him, and he had this great fight. So he still got really excited when the lights went down. Totally, there was huge potential. Yeah, totally, yeah, you know? totally, yeah, and yeah. And you were seeing it before everyone else, you know. Yeah. The, that that was that excitement as well, you know. These were all, and 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 by and large, there is an air of of optimism, an air of positivity, an air of hope. Anyone that goes to a film festival, they really want the films to be great. Like they're 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 invested. They're physically by their presence. They're psychologically and emotionally by their in, uh, attention and their hope. They're invested in the films working, in the filmmakers having a good time, in the actors realizing characters in a strong and clear and moving way. You know, so to be around again that degree of focused positivity and optimism, and it's not. You know, it's not foolish. It's not wishy-washy. It's very active and it's very engaged. is a, is a really lovely thing, a really powerful thing. But I want I want to bring you to to one film that I have very special connection to, which is my first year and um, as festival director, I was desperate to find the perfect opening night film, and I couldn't work out. It was the first time I was going to be programming the big Savoy space, you know, and then I saw In Bruges, and I just thought, yes, it's here. We've oh, got nice. it. Fantastic. Nice. And I, I remember so clearly there was yourself and Brendan and Martin and Clemence were all there. Yeah. It rocked. It was that fantastic. Was a, that was an amazing night. That was an amazing night. Again, that was, you know, because that was, I mean, you know, you'd be lying if you said there wasn't a, 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 a distinct, or if I said there wasn't a distinct form of national pride um, anytime you get to do anything in the name of our island. And, and to have Martin you know, having written and directed this piece and to have me and Brendan, who was, you know, at the time and remains, of course, one of my favorite actors and, and favorite human beings, basically. Um, but to be able to have that experience with them lads and then bring it home and Clemence to come over and, you know, it was it was very special. It was a very special experience shooting the film. It's very special script, you know, the whole thing was very, it just, and it felt like there was a harmony. It felt like it was supposed to yeah. get its, its debut and its screening at the Dublin International Film yeah. Festival, it really did. Um, yeah, that was a glorious time. And that was me first, you know, it was great because that was as well, that my life was very different, you know, by the time yeah. In Bruges came out, by the time we shot In Bruges, you know, it was one of the, it was one of the first films I did. I think it was the second or third film I did sober. You know, so it was, and I think it was the first film festival I had attended sober. And let me tell you, after 15 or 20 years of, of carousing the way I carouse, you know, drinking the way I drink, the sober world is a pretty scary world, you know, yeah, can be. Yeah, yeah. And, and genuinely, so to come home and to do it sober and, and not have the buffer, not have the support of a few drinks just to calm the nerves. Yeah. Um, you know, it was an, it was a really amazing thing. And I remember being more nervous. I remember being more uncomfortable initially at that film festival than any others because I didn't have any booze in me, basically, obviously. Um, but the, as so often happens, the flip side of that was having gotten through the initial discomfort 
and the initial self-judgments or whatever tensions were created inside me, um, having gotten through those initially, it was easily the most rewarding film festival that yeah, I had in Dublin. Yeah. Easily, easily the most rewarding experience and the most memorable and the one I could remember most. Yeah, it's funny because I want to ask you a question about audiences because I've yeah. seen that film. I went on a mad tour after that fe um, festival. I went to loads of other festivals and I ended up watching in Bruges in lots of different places. Oh, you did? Yeah. Well, you tell me, what was that like? Well, I saw it in Budapest and it was just hilarious because they, they, they started laughing really, really quickly. Ah, and they missed. And, and I kind of get this sense, you know how Toronto audiences are also very different. They've got a mm -hmm. kind of different texture to it. But yeah. for you, because you're obviously literally watching them, trying to spot if they get the nuances of things that right. you're doing. What, what is what is the difference between, an, you know, Dublin or an Irish audience and an international audience for some some of your films? I mean, I've only, um, I've only experienced, it's funny, I've only experienced the audiences uh, during films that I've been in. And so I am so uncomfortable during, yeah. you know, before, during, and after. I mean, I re after is where I'm at most relieved because the press has been done, the film's been seen and what have you. Um, so it's hard for me to have a, that level of objectivity. What I will say is, of course, um, in in can if i remember correctly you can you can sense a kind of a a more um a kind of a sense of a highbrow discernment in can you know you can kind of when i said everyone there is a fan remember i said a few minutes ago yeah. people go to film festivals they're all fans they're all hoping that the film works yeah. if there's one film festival that mightn't be that apparent it's it's perhaps can and i have loved my time at can yeah. and if anyone from can sees this i'm not speaking ill about you relax relax i'm just saying you know the audience are are a little bit harsher there toronto they're incredibly supportive they are i mean the canadian yeah. people as a whole are incredibly warm and supportive and, and they just want what's best for everyone um and in during in bruges what i remember that year was laughter yes i had never done a film i had never done a film and never been to a premiere where there was so much laughter no. and i just remember the kind of sense of bomb or elixir that again communal laughter can can leave you with you know that yes. sense of healing you know yes. to share laughter and to share in the gaiety of a moment with a bunch of people and and to be a part of eliciting that laughter oh my god i was high as a kite yeah on, on my most sober year i was, I was high as a kite yeah. i really was it really was it was amazing i'd never and i remember sitting there and, and thinking holy shit is this what comedians those who do comedies yeah. Yeah. live with you know and of course it's of course it's as we know knowing a little bit about the lives of comedians you know it's not that simple of course it can be quite quite counterintuitive where that all comes from and and what it leaves one with after performance but i just thought it was a, it was a really lovely thing and the audience i did get what we've spoken about already at nauseam which was the sense of pride that the audience had in, yeah. in martin and in brendan and me and in and me and them and it was just it was a it was a really really uh spectacularly um beautiful evening and it's really interesting because you know charging back to some of the other films that we've shown and some some of you've been here for like ondine which was another you know great opening night and a yeah. film that we showed last year which was street leagues which is a yes. wonderful documentary um about you know that the um yeah that the almost world cup yeah brilliant but, you know, what's lovely is, is, is festivals kind of embrace, you know, films that are coming out. They're kind of big films, small films. Totally. Uh, and for Street Leagues, there was a great chance to see, you know, a, a, a kind of a, an Irish story, but told brilliantly. I mean, those two guys are fantastic. Yeah, they're fantastic. And it was obviously, I mean, you get involved in something like documenting the Street Leagues and, and, and the players, the athletes and the organizers of that league. You're not doing it for money. Do you yeah. know what I mean? You're doing truly. I mean, there's just no argument. You're doing it because you have a passion and you you want to advocate for for some kind of um, change, some kind of change in community, change in legislation, change in a shift in perspective. Yeah. You know. So I was I was delighted and humbled to be able to be part of that and to be able to be in in any small way part of the the homeless World Cup. You know, the street leagues through the years. 
but that's what again what your festival and what what all festivals offer the opportunity for is for young voices and and first time filmmakers as well to have an arena whereby they can they can put their work out there so that they can be seen by other filmmakers they can be seen by studios as well they can be bought purchased by you know people who are willing to distribute their work to a, a, a broader audience and that they can be seen as well by the cinema going audience you know yeah it's important i mean sundance obviously you know and then there's the 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 parallel uh, institutions that can be created like the sundance lab you know yeah. i mean i was i did the sundance lab with I think with Peter McDonald, uh, I don't even know if it was before or after Drinking Crude, but I remember being down in Ballinasloe, I think it was in Ballinasloe, doing um, a few nights at the Sundance Lab, you know, and it was just a bunch of actors staying in a cottage and, and getting up with a little, a little handy cam on tripods and, and working out a scene, and it was gloriously no frills, and we were just in there trying to figure out, all of us, what we were doing, the filmmaker, the writer, the actors, and... And it was extraordinary. And that was all by virtue of Sundance, which was, of course, the brainchild of Robert Redford and, and is essentially a film festival. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it has created so many careers, you know, I mean, yeah. in that way. I mean, it is literally, you know, like a, a launch pad or, a, you know, a kind yeah. of a, la a, a laboratory of talent, you know? Yes, totally. Yeah. And one thing I wanted just to... To, to kind of ask you about, I suppose, is, is have you a chance or had a chance to see this year's program or anything that you're kind of just I'm excited to, to see um, I'm excited to see uh, Dervis film uh, Ammonite. What, 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 what yeah. Yeah, yeah, Ammonite. Yeah, Ammonite. Yeah, I'm excited yeah. to see that. I just love Dervis. That just, she's just extraordinary. And and um, and I'm excited. I really want to see Supernova. It looks beautiful. Yeah, it's really he's that filmmaker Harry McQueen. Yeah. He's really really exciting i think he's got it, a beautiful eye and this it looks very beautiful how are you doing it Gronya? how are you doing the screenings and stuff how's it going all by inventive so it's on a it's on an online platform so we dropped by about 50 percent down to about 65 films um not bad not bad sports. yeah not bad, not bad we've, got a, we've got a retro um and we've got loads of features we've got fantastic films from places like korea and mexico and Brilliant. Lots of new Irish work, fantastic documentaries. Um, and actually, we have a project that's coming to LA, but you're going to have gone. So I'll try and get it to, uh, to Australia, which is a music video project called Playback that Erica mm. Cody and Mike Donnelly have curated. Brilliant hip hop music videos being made in Ireland. And we're going to tour it. Can you, can you send me anything? Or, I mean, I'd love to just be able to yeah. check in anyway. No, yeah. absolutely. I will. I will in an absolute heartbeat. So listen, Colin, I'm conscious of your time and uh, there's a couple of oh, questions good. kind of yeah, go on. at the end. So um, this one is, um, when did you first fall in love with the cinema? Uh, first of all, in love with the cinema. Well, I, I grew up on a, a lot of staples of commercial American cinema, like, you know, the Indiana Joneses and Back to the Futures and Jaws and um, great films that stand the test of time, all of them as far as I'm concerned. But I think I had a, I had a, a girlfriend once upon a time, a long time ago through the mists of, and uh, she showed me Paris, Texas. And Paris, Texas was kind of a turning point for me. You know, it was, it, it was the first time that I, I, it was the first time I can remember. I mean, when I saw E.T. when I was a kid in the cinema, in the Savoy on O'Connor Street with my uncle Tommy, I remember bawling, crying. So don't get me wrong, E.T. did reach into my heart and slap it about for a bit. But as a young man, the first time as a kind of a version or a prototype of an adult, the first time I remember a film really getting into my psyche, really getting into my mind and really getting into my heart and, and, and almost terrifying me with its representation of loneliness and loss, which are two very serious themes that we all have to contend with at certain stages in our lives. Well, that first time was Vim Vendor's Paris, Texas, you know, and, and to this day, it's, it's still one of my favorite top five films and just one of the most moving cinema experiences that I've ever had still. And I've never seen it on a big screen. I look forward to hopefully someday seeing it on a big screen. Right. Right. There'll be a rerun or something like that. Um, but yeah, and just the screen and still to this day, the, the, the most beautifully written and beautifully performed monologue that I've ever seen in cinema, you know, when he, when Harry Dean Stanton and Travis turns the, 
I mean, just that gesture when he it, when I saw it the first time when he turned the seat around because he couldn't look at her. It was too much to look at her. And if he was going to recount what he knew of their shared time together, he had to go inside. So he turned the chair around and sat while she was the other side of the glass screen. I mean, I'll never forget it. I knew these two people, these people once, these two people. And he launched it. So that was the first, the first. Uh, that was kind of the thing. That, yeah. That is a good. That is best answer I've heard. Was, well, that was the one, you know, the, as I said, yeah. there was so many other things before that were so, and, and I still go back to entertainment and I, you know, cinema and film as pure entertainment and as pure diversion is, is also plays a great part of my life, but as provocation and as, as a, a kind of tender reflection of the struggles of what it is to be a human being. Paris, Texas gets the yeah. gold medal. Inventors, Sam Shepard. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. Dream yeah, yeah. Dream team. Yeah. And um, the part you wished you played? Uh, Tootsie. <laughs> <laughs> Tootsie. Yeah. Tootsie. 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 Also one of my favorite films. And just, you know, I mean, I th yeah, it'd be, you know, tricky now, of course, but I think because of exactly how that character is structured and that story is structured, I think maybe, uh, possibly, um, uh, you'd be able to do it. I don't know, but anyway, that one. I just love that film. I just yeah. that, that role and Dustin Hoffman's just perfect in it. And then everyone, everyone in it again is, you know, Sidney Pollack at his best, and and Gina Charles Dern, Charles Durning, and Jessica Lang, and Bill Murray, and um, yeah, it's a brilliant cast. Brilliant cast and a perfect film. But yeah, that would have been that one would have been fun. And he's great. He's so unlike. Like, he's such an asshole. You know, uh, <laughs> Dorsey. He's, he's such an asshole at the start. I mean, he's so unlikable. He's kind of one of those that's likable because he's so unlikable. He's so egocentric and, and he's brilliant. Dustin is so brilliant and he doesn't shy away from that at all. He laps it up. And then by the end, you know, when he's in the bar and he's broken down and he, and he comes to give the ring back to, <laughs> to Charles Durning and Charles Durning doesn't even look at him, goes outside, give it to me outside, you know, because he wants to slap the head off him. Um, but anyway, yeah, Tootsie, Tootsie be my answer. Fantastic. And then the final one is what's the favorite part that you've played yourself? Oh boy. Uh, oh man. God, this is such a, I could go to tag it boring. I could, if there's anyone still awake, I could have them asleep in 30 seconds with the, the beginning of what would be a very long winded answer to this one. Cause they all just mean different things at different times. And, um, but I, I was supposed to, the obvious answer and the obvious because it's true is, is, uh, is on Dean. And because that experience was very special because I still, you know, as I said, there's a, there's a, a magic little, yeah. 11 year old, little 11 year old upstairs now who's doing his homeschooling and, and he's only yeah. there by virtue of that film. And, and that character of Syracuse um, and that story and, and working with Neil um, and being shooting in one of my favorite parts of the world. Yeah. Hands down, if not my favorite to be honest with you, part of the world, the Bear Peninsula and Castletown Bear. And that's where I did Falling for a Dancer for the BBC. It was my first professional yeah. job. So to go back to, uh, to go back to Castletown Bear, uh, you know, 15 years later and do on Dean with Neil was extraordinary and with Alicia. So I think that character, yeah, I'll say that character. That was a great choice. No, I, I well remember it actually, because uh, I remember you had got a very new baby when you were in Dublin for that, for yeah. that screening, and you were feeling the new baby's kind of Bathers. changing your tongue. <laughs> right yeah, yeah. Well, he's not a new baby anymore. Doing his things, doing good. They're both, they're both good lads. Colin, thank you so, so much. You've been thanks a million, Grana, for, for taking the time. Generous with your time, so thanks a million. Not at all. It's a pleasure talking to you, love.